Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Tim Chadbourne. I'm Head of Behavioural Insights and Evaluation Lead at Public Health England. Um, lots of people joining us today and a few more people just coming along. I would very much ask you just to please mute your phones. We've tried to do that from our end. But it's very important that people can all hear what we're saying. We've got a very exciting webinar for you, hopefully this afternoon. One hour on the new ABC Guide to Behaviour Change, commissioned by Public Health England and written by UCL Centre for Behaviour Change. We're calling this the ABC Guide, as we hope it will be the first in a series of guides for achieving behaviour change, ABC. The guide is available at bit.ly forward slash ABC Guide 1, and we will be tweeting at hashtag ABC Guide. Please note the recording is open to the public, uh, but we will be making this available shortly afterwards. We've got 35 minutes of presentations, followed by questions and answers from attendees. We'll have a brief introduction from me, and then with great pleasure and huge thanks to the lead authors of the guide, we'll have Professor Susan Mickey, who is Director of the Centre for Behaviour Change, and Professor of Health Psychology at University College London. She'll be giving a bit of a background to the behaviour change wheel, talking about the need for the guide and how the guide was developed. Then we have Professor Robert West, who is Professor of Health Psychology at University College London and world expert on smoking cessation and addiction. He'll be going through the underlying principles within the guide, the content and how to use the guide. And then thanks again to Dr. Michelle Constable, Head of the Behaviour Change Unit at Hertfordshire County Council and Chair-Elect of the Behavioural Science and Public Health Network. She'll be sharing some reflections from local government. And finally, we will have questions from the panel, uh, from for the panel for attendees. Uh, and again, please submit these ideally through the instant message function on Skype. That'll be the most useful way that we can sort of collect your questions and put them to the panel. Fantastic. Right. Through to the first slide. So firstly, I just want to give a very brief background of the context in which we're working on this. Um, in October 2018, Public Health England um, published a behavioural and social science strategy for population health and wellbeing in England. It's a very much a collaborative piece of work with a number of different organisations, about 40 organisations in total who contributed content, but um, primarily we had the Association of Directors of Public Health, the Faculty, Faculty of Public Health, the Behavioural Science and Public Health Network, and the Local Government Association as, as core partners in the writing group. This really was in response to feedback from local public health around the mixed levels of understanding of behavioural science, uh, and the high importance that was played in terms of embedding behavioural science into the practice of their organisations. But there was not enough, not enough information on um, how to embed this behavioural science in practice, where to access support uh, or resources to do so. So it provided an overall vision and aims in terms of a framework for the broad public health system to increase the impact uh, and integration of behavioural social sciences very much aiming to deliver improved health and well-being outcomes, reduced health inequalities, and improved value to the public purse. And this, the, the strategy was very much helping to coalesce and coordinate efforts of national organisations to support professionals at the local level. You can see the um, on the right of this slide, we've got the multiple different types of organisations that were supporting and, and engaging with this, from national policy and delivery professional societies and networks, colleges and, acad and academies, and uh, research funders and think tanks. The key messages in the strategy were it provided a high level guide with a suite of evidence and theory informed resources. And this ABC Guide to Behaviour Change is one of those resources that has followed from that. The scope was very much around the systems and organisations acting on the social and structural environment that affects the population and not just individual behaviour change. And the strategy aimed and has been working to um, develop a strong and vibrant behavioural and social science community. And um, integrated transdisciplinary approaches have, have been key to this. It provided a bit of a roadmap. Uh, we had eight priority themes 
uh, that we had identified that were needed to support the system to better use behavioral science. Some of the actions or, or products are there on the right hand side of a table. And just to sort of identify a few of those, the Behavioral Science and Public Health Network has been developing a contact directory of behavioral science experts and public health professionals uh, to meet that need of where to access expertise. The EQUIP project, uh, led by Coventry University, has been developing guidance for local public health commissioners. Um, health Education England uh, has been developing a behaviour change development framework and toolkit. And uh, the Behavioural Science Public Health Network has been developing or will be developing a guide to employing behavioural and social scientists in public health. And finally, they're also an online forum for resources and tools. So a number of products are coming out to meet those needs that we identified. And that just hopefully provides you a little bit of a context for this piece of work and this guide, hopefully helping meet some of that need for local public health and other local organisations in terms of actually accessing evidence-based theory and, develop and guidance for implementing behavioural science and behaviour change in your local areas. So with that, I'm very much, uh, very much uh, excited to hand over to Professor Susan Mickey, who's going to take us through the next set of slides. But thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Fantastic. Yes. Good. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the background to this guide is that there's increasing recognition that human behaviour lies at the heart of national government and local authority policies that are aimed at promoting good health and well-being in the population, also preventing and managing ill health and delivering high quality evidence based and equitable services. So as well as uh, needing to factor behaviour into designing, implementing and evaluating policies and interventions amongst policymakers and planners, we also need uh, tools to support this work. For many years, I worked with the Department of Health and indeed I'm currently with the Department of Health and Social Care in the Behavioural Sciences Policy Research Unit, worked with policymakers who expect, expressed a desire for a framework they could use but one that was comprehensive, many of the ones they came across were partial, that was coherent, and very importantly, was usable by a wide range of people. So I set about looking to see whether such a framework existed and uh, conducted a systematic review um, of uh, behavior change across many domains, including culture change, environmental change, social marketing, et cetera, and identified 19 and noticed a couple of things that none were actually comprehensive. And also there was considerable overlap uh, between them. And what were in those frameworks could generally be thought of at two levels, uh, direct interventions, but also um, the, the longer term and uh, higher level policies uh, that support uh, those interventions. So it made sense to bring those together into uh, one framework, synthesizing the 19 frameworks. Um, and um, we did this and presented it, as you can see, as uh, what we called a behavior change wheel. Um, the red uh, rim around the wheel are nine different intervention types, very broad intervention types. And the gray outer wheel or rim is uh, our seven policy options uh, supporting those. And in the middle, uh, we put uh, what is the simplest but also comprehensive model of uh, behaviour, which we called COMBI, um, on the basis that the three general influences on behaviour that needed to be in place if behaviour is to happen is capability. People need the, the psychological and the physical capability. They also need the motivation uh, to enact the behaviour. And importantly, they need the opportunity. So both the physical, but also the social um, opportunity to enact the behavior. So this model is very much behavior in its context. And as you can see, it's um, itself a little system uh, so that these influences um, interact with each other to bring about behavior. Uh, next slide. Um, 
we found that this uh, tool was very extensively uh, used, both in the UK, but also internationally. And we're a small group at the Centre for Behaviour Change. We used to run uh, workshops uh, just uh, for this to understand and implement it, but uh, the demand far outstripped what we could offer. And so we put together a lot of our materials into um, a guide. Um, however, there was a real need uh, for people working on the front line, busy everyday uh, jobs that didn't have time uh, to read the book, uh, to have a much shorter, um, much more streamlined guide with case studies that illustrated the application of it uh, to their own worlds of work. Public Health England therefore commissioned uh, the Centre for Behaviour Change to produce two guides, one uh, for local government and one for national government. And we've written it for a very wide range of audiences and we're very grateful to all the stakeholder feedback and feedback from Public Health England from uh, both Anna Salas and Tim Chadford. And the case studies were uh, given to us um, by the network of people we work with. So we're very grateful for that. And finally, in the next slide I'm going to present is the writing team. So uh, both Robert and I, as Tim mentioned, but also, importantly, Paul Chadwick, Lou Atkins and Fabi Lauren-Catto, who are all colleagues at the Centre for Behaviour Change. So that's something about um, the background to it, why we have did it, did it and why this brief guide has been commissioned. And now I'll hand over to uh, Robert West to take you through what's actually in the guide. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan. And uh, if you could just go to the next slide, um, I'll uh, start to do that. Um, so the uh, the book that uh, Susan referred to uh, obviously has a lot of stuff in it, and I think what people a lot of people found is that um, it's quite a lot to get your teeth into, uh, particularly if you're not a, a, an expert or a specialist in the area. Uh, and so what we've tried to do uh, with this guide is to distill the key elements uh, in a way that hopefully. Um, even if one isn't a behavioural scientist, one can understand the principles and and work with. But uh, ultimately, um, you know, with as with any area of expertise, it, it's good to have uh, you know an expert in uh, involved in the process. So, so um, what this slide shows uh, is uh, an attempt to capture the six key processes. Uh, that needs to be undertaken in order to arrive at an effective intervention, recognising that there are three main use cases for this kind of approach. One of them, which is the kind that's emphasised in the Behaviour Change Wheel book, um, is if you're starting from scratch, you've got a blank sheet of paper and you need to develop an intervention to solve a particular problem. Um, but of course, many people working in uh, government, local government, central government or uh, other sorts of practitioners are not start starting with a blank sheet of paper. They've already got interventions that they may either want to decide whether they want to continue with it or they need to, they need to modify it in some way because of the changing context or they've got an intervention that's working in one area and they want to apply it to a related area. So they're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. That's the second use case. And in the third use case, quite often, um, you may be in a situation where you're commissioning a service which involves behavior change um, or someone's coming to you with an idea. And what you want to be able to do is to say, well, which of these approaches that's being pushed, put forward to us or that are being proposed uh, is the one that's most likely to deliver what we want. So those are the three main use cases that we see. The six processes that are involved, you can see on the screen, um, at the heart of the process is, the, is assessment. And I'm going to and I'm going to go through each of these six processes uh, in order. Um, but one of the key one of the reasons why they're presented in this way as a sort of hub and spoke model is that assessment really applies to every part of the rest of the process, whether it's it's the initial coming up with the idea all the way through to constructing the intervention and eventually delivering it. So I'm going to talk about assessment first. Um, then if you were starting from scratch, 
one of the things you would do is to, and very importantly, is to identify the behavior. Now that seems like a really simple task. You know, what, how, how hard can that be? Actually, it turns out to be a really crucial, crucial task and by no means obvious. Um, another part of the process that Susan's alluded to is what we call the combi diagnosis. That's to say, working out what needs to change in the system for the required behavior to occur. And the combi model uh, breaks this down into capability, opportunity, and motivation. Uh, now, having got a combi diagnosis, you then can go on to say, well, what kind of intervention is going to be most relevant in our case in order to be able to achieve that, uh, uh, that uh, change? And that's the selecting the intervention type. Then uh, you have the strategic issue of formulating an intervention strategy, which uh, if you're going sort of clockwise around this thing, this, this would be on the top left quadrant here, um, you've, your strategy. And it's really important to separate out the kind of intervention content that you're interested in uh, from the strategy. And I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. And then you've, then you've got to build the intervention, whether it's an app or whether it's a service or whether it's a piece of legislation or uh, some other kind of policy, you've got to build the details of it. Now, I'm just going to go through each of those six processes very briefly um, uh, before handing you over to the next speaker. So if you go to the next slide, we'll start with the um, assessment. How do, we, how do we go about assessing interventions? And one of the key insights that we try to put across in this guide is that although it's very natural to, fe uh, to focus on effectiveness, uh, that is only one of the criteria which we have to use when we're determining whether or not to go ahead with an intervention or an intervention concept. And the others are acceptability, practicability, obviously effectiveness, which would include cost effectiveness and also, by the way, includes uh, reach. So we're really talking about the overall impact in achieving the goals that we're setting out for ourselves within the population that we're interested in. And then the fourth one is affordability. Is, can it be delivered to scale with the budget that we're interested in um, or we have available to us? And then the fifth one is side effects, which can also be thought of as spillover effects because they could be positive or negative. Um, and obviously, if you've got a drug intervention, we talk about side effects. But it's very important when you're designing behavior change interventions to think, well, what other consequences are there going to be down the line uh, for this intervention? And then last but very much not least, uh, we have the issue of equity. Is this going to increase or decrease um, inequalities in our society? So you apply all of those criteria uh, and the guide goes through these in, in some detail so that you can see how it can be done. If you go to the next slide, you'll see an example of how it might work in a very, very simplified situation. Let's say your target um, is to reduce adult obesity in your area and you're a local authority. Uh, and uh, there are a number of different ways in which you can do it, but you're considering three possible uh, options. One would be setting up a weight management service or continuing to fund one if you already have one. One might be job subsidized gym membership, uh, which you might make available to target groups, for example. Another one might be a healthy meals uh, media campaign that you would launch through local papers, local radio, uh, through various other sources. So we're, the, the point here is we're applying the appease criteria not to a fully fledged intervention, but right at the beginning of the process to the, uh, the concept. And even at this stage, before we've even decided what behaviors we're going to be looking at because um, because you know as you can see a weight management service might look at uh, diet and exercise behaviors G a gym membership might be focusing on exercise and healthy meals is obviously focusing primarily on diet now what you would do and, and we've done this um, in London for a, a identifying high priority um, uh, uh, areas to look at for a, a pan London um, smoking cessation program um, is you take each of these and you 
Um, use whatever resources you have available to you, whether it's literature reviews, whether it's direct evidence, whether sometimes all you've got is local knowledge or discussion, or you may commission some research in order to find out. You do whatever your resources are available to kind of quantify or semi-quantify where each option lies on these. And so you can see on the example, you've got acceptability, which you could rate from 0 to 10. Um, there are lots of different ways of doing this. This is really just, just to structure thinking in this area. Um, uh, you can see that when we're looking at spillover effects, we're looking at minus 5 to plus 5 because we want to take account of the fact that there may be negative or positive ones and ditto with uh, equity where it's a bi it's a bi-directional thing and just for the sake of argument uh, what might happen here is you you pull together the evidence you get an expert group or you get people in a room each one might independently use whatever their knowledge base is to come up with a sort of broad brush uh, figure for this and then you, uh, what we did in the London program is we actually just uh, looked to see what the consensus was, um, where the areas of uncertainty were, <clears throat> and sort of totted up the scores. And what was really interesting about it was it's not going to give you the absolute fine grained answer because a lot of these things, of course, are going to be subject to um, uncertainty or, or, or differences of opinion. But it very quickly shows you uh, which uh, which are the no hopers? Which are the ones that you you know really this is not going to have enough impact, or this one is going to have lots of impact if only we could do it, but seriously it's not affordable or it's not going to be practicable with uh, with the resources that we've got available, for example. Um, so that just gives you an example of how it might work, and there's an, uh, there's uh, uh, um, there's other uh, examples, uh, another example in the uh, in the guide. Next slide. Um, OK, so, so that's the assessment process, which, as I say, that structured process can be applied all the way through the development and implementation of the intervention. And one of the reasons why you want to do that is because you may start with a concept and you may decide halfway through or, or at a fairly early stage of that concept that it actually isn't going to run. New information becomes available where you think, well, actually, this, this, this particular thing's not going anywhere. We need to go, we need to have a rethink about it. Or you may get all the way to the end and do a randomized controlled trial or some very formal evaluation, which can give you information uh, that's much more detailed on what you've what you've developed. Right. Now let's look at the other five key processes here. The first one is behavior selection. In some cases, it's pretty obvious. In other cases, it's very far from obvious. Um, what you're trying to uh, decide is who the classic questions of who needs to do what, where, when, and even for how long. But you've also got to think about not only the, the behavior you're interested, for example, um, uh, you know, going to the gym or increased walking or whatever it might be, but also other behaviours that could play that could impact on that. So, so if you go to the next slide, what we're recommending in um, <clears throat> in the guide is, and I've just used a simple uh, uh, program Draw.io to do this because it's free. Uh, we we tend to use Lucidchart, which uh, you uh, for large scale use you have to pay for, but it is a bit more powerful. Um, but you, you could do it on a, with a, on a piece of paper or a flip chart with a, a pens and so on. But essentially the key is to identify certain things like who are the people who are involved in this behavior? Let's say in this particular case that you're trying to um, uh, change the BMI of, um, uh, of children in a, in a particular school. And they could do this by increasing their physical activity. They could do this by uh, changing their diet. Um, so some of these lines, the, the green ones, are kind of influence type relationships. The black lines are property type uh, relationships. So, um, so you've got the child. They may, you may change diet, increase uh, physical activity, change BMI. What you see here is that there are lots of other um, actors in this situation who may be playing a role. Now, what it helps you to do when you do this is to say, well, where are the key levers? What's the thing that's going to make the most difference, that is most practicable, that's affordable, et cetera, et cetera, in order to achieve our objective? Um, so you draw this kind of uh, simple systems map. Um, it, it doesn't have to be fancy, although obviously the more informed it is, the better. If you go on to the next slide. Um, 
So once you've decided on who gonna, whose behavior you're going to target and what kind of behavior it is, then, then you go on to what Susan was talking about, which is this combi diagnosis. And you start with the basic, very fundamental uh, principle of any behavior, which is that in order for a behavior to occur, um, those people who are involved have to ha have to have all three of the capability, the opportunity, which is the environment in which they're, uh, they're sitting, um, and the motivation to be able to do it. And if any of those is missing, it won't occur. And so the, the target here is to, is to see which of these, it may be all three, it may be one, it may be another, is going to give us the best uh, chance of enabling and motivating and giving the right opportunity for this behavior to occur. So you do that combi diagnosis and uh, the guide tells you how to do that. Next slide. Um, having identified where you want to make your change, for example, is, is it the case that all you need to do is to increase someone's motivation because everything else is in place? or that what you need to do, actually motivation's already there, it's the capability that's the problem. You need to help to build their skills or build their knowledge base and so on in order to do it. Um, once you've decided that, then you move on to the next stage in which you're looking at the intervention types. And that's what Susan was talking about when she was talking about the red inner uh, or sort of middle ring of the behavior change wheel. And there's a mapping. It's a rough mapping that it, none of these things are sort of set in stone. Each situation may be different, but we provide an indication in the guide as to a mapping between uh, which of the combi elements fits better onto the kind of intervention type that you're going to use, whether it's education, persuasion, uh, incentivization, coercion, and so on. Um, a word of warning about the terms that we're using. Um, we're, we're using those terms in a somewhat sort of technical way. So you'd have to look at the guide to make sure that you understand it. So for example, coercion is very much about, it's not about physically forcing people to do something. It's about um, the kind of uh, punishment and avoidance learning that you might put in place or the threat of it or the or the promise of it. Whereas incentivization is very much about uh, providing positive incentives in order to do things. And sometimes one is going to be appropriate and sometimes others. Um, uh, and this cover, this is intended to cover the full gamut of those uh, different types of broad approaches that you might be doing. So at this stage, you're not you're not fine tuning your intervention. You're just getting, well, what is the broad area that we want to be working in? And you, and you sort of tick off which of these you think is going to work. Next slide. <clears throat> um, having done that, you then go on to the stage, which is the strategy. How are you going to deliver that? So, for example, let's say what you feel or what you need to do is a bit of persuasion. Um, that is get people to feel differently about things um, in order to try and influence their behavior. Um, you can do that in many different ways. You could produce guidelines. You could, uh, you, you could provide a service, for example, or you could use an existing service with healthcare professionals in order to deliver that persuasive communication. And in smoking cessation is a classic example where you've got, you've got um, potentially GPs, practice nurses and healthcare professionals delivering brief advice, which is a form of persuasion in many cases, or you could use mass media, or you could ideally um, have these things working in concert with each other so that they reinforce each other. So guidelines, legislation, you can provide a service. Uh, if you're central government, or if you've got some opportunity to take fiscal policies through taxation, through, through that kind of thing, uh, then you, do, you could try that. Uh, environmental and social planning, obviously you've got uh, uh, town planning, you've got a whole range of different ways in which you can change people's environments. You've got your marketing campaigns, you could introduce restrictions um, through uh, short of legislation uh, and you can regulate. So those are all the different ways in which you might deliver it. And the guide gives you, a, again, a sort of mapping as to which of these is most likely to be relevant for what kind of intervention type. Next slide. Um, and then finally, you've got to the point at which, right, now you've got the details of the intervention um, that you need to put together, whether it's an app or whether it's a leaflet or whether it's a service or whatever. And you can divide this detail into two components, the content, 
which are the what we call the behavior change techniques, the kinds of the specific kind of things that you want to include in the intervention. But of course, there's many different ways of delivering that. Um, and you've got different sources. Should it be coming from this source? Should it be coming from a GP? Should it be coming from a practice nurse, a midwife? Should it be delivered through a um, uh, uh, a Public Health England document. Um, you've got the mode of delivery, which would be in person, face to face, group, uh, again through um, uh, social media and so on. And then, of course, you've got the schedule of delivery. Is it a one off? Is it something you want to do over a, a period of time and so on? So, what this does is it gives you the structure that helps you to, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, if you, to, to um, think about all these different types of things. And what we do in the guide is to, I'm just, hmm? uh, what we do in the guide is to uh, uh, sort of wrap this up into a relatively simple framework. Now, many of you will be familiar with the East framework or Mindspace. Um, this isn't that different, but the, the key difference from this framework, which is called NEAR, um, is that it is specifically linked to all the stuff that I've said before, to all that content, so that it gives you an idea about which of these you're trying to uh, apply in order to achieve your goal. Um, and, uh, and it probably makes a lot of sense to you. You can see, is it normal? Is it easy, attractive routine? You've got to try and make it all of those things. Um, next slide. Um, and then when it comes to the delivery, um, we've got to think about who the source is, um, who's delivering it. it. Should be a credible source, it should be a trusted source, an authoritative source, that kind of thing. What channel is most relevant and, and particularly cost effective? Um, and when is it best to do it? Do you, do you want to front load the, inv the, uh, the intervention uh, or do you want to spread it out over time? That kind of thing. And then uh, in the last slide, the next slide, um, it's just pulling it back all together and to make a couple of key points. One is this guide is not a substitute for topic specific expertise uh, because there's no substitute for that. What it is, is a way of helping you if you've got that expertise or access to it to structure um, the way that you develop and evaluate in, uh, interventions so that you cover all the bases and make sure that stuff doesn't get uh, forgotten about and that it's done in ideally the most efficient uh, uh, and economic way possible. So that's all I've got to say. And now I think it's I, I hand over to um, Michelle. Thank I believe. You. Um, the remit of local authorities is very broad. And we are working at a time of increased pressures and limited resources. We have a legal responsibility to use our resources and funding in the most effective way, which is actually written into law for local government. Many of our aspirations and strategic aims rely on people changing their behaviour. And typically, when we think about behaviour change, we think of residents. So we might think of recycling behaviours or reducing water consumption. However, we also might need to focus on our staff or the partners that we're working with. We might want to increase uh, integrated working between teams. Behavioural science can be applied to each of these areas to support this work. There's a huge opportunity to embed behavioural science across the system, to enhance and support local authorities to deliver effective and efficient services. When we're developing programmes of work, we're very good at drawing together a range of evidence. So we might use the JSNA, epidemiology, what's worked in other organisations and programme evaluations. However, behavioural science and behavioural aspects of programmes can be overlooked. Sometimes our interventions don't work because we don't explore what influences people's behaviour or use good frameworks to design appropriate interventions. And that, that runs the risk of jumping to conclusions about solutions. By taking a behavioural informed approach, we enhance the chance of success as we're taking into account how people behave in a given situation as well as the barriers and facilitators to them carrying out what we're actually asking them to do and what we want to achieve. There are some excellent examples of behavioural science being applied in local authorities across the country. But I've been having a number of conversations with local authority officers since the launch of the strategy. And the feedback that I've received is that people don't have the confidence to apply these, skill, uh, these skills in practice. 
The ABC Guide aims to fill that gap by offering an evidence and theory-based framework to understand behaviour and links that explicitly to intervention design. It provides a useful and practical approach to embedding behavioural science in practice to maximise efficiency, equity and effectiveness. Since the launch of the Behavioural and Social Science Strategy, there's been a growing interest and momentum around the application of behavioural science and different approaches have been taken around the country in how we go about applying this. In some areas, behaviour change leads have been recruited and in other areas there are teams of behaviour change specialists. I'd like to share with you the approach that we've taken in Hertfordshire and just some of the work that we've been involved in. In Hertfordshire, we recognise that create, in order to create a meaningful change, we would need a team to support embedding behavioural science across the organisation. We're working across directorates, supporting a range of projects, including fostering, um, SEND, use of recycling centres, as well as working with our adult care services. We're an enabling programme for the wider transformation programme of work. And fundamentally, we're using the behaviour change wheel as our consultancy model. We're using this to understand the behavioural aspects of the issues that we're trying to work with, to identify which parts of the system we should be targeting and developing interventions based on this work. We've worked closely with our comms team to develop campaigns, as well as working with colleagues across the organisation on specific pieces of work, as well as giving light touch advice and support to colleagues across the organisation. We've delivered a range of uh, training to organisations using the COMBI to help frontline staff consider key components of behaviour change in their practice, as well as developing competency frameworks to support this. The support for the team within Hertfordshire and the use of the behaviour change will have been very well received as a way of approaching this work. It's early days, but the interest continues to grow and we're now creating a pipeline of work to be taken forward over the coming months. The behaviour change will can be applied to different types of work that we're involved in. It can be used uh, for intervention development, it can be used for reviewing existing programmes and services, but I wanted to briefly share one example where we've used it in a campaign that was called It's Never Too Late to Be Active. The programme aimed to uh, move people who were inactive older adults, so inactive older adults, um, to uh, it, performing some physical activity and those who were doing some physical activity to move them nearer to the national guide, uh, guidelines. There isn't time to go into any detail, but we embedded behavioural science in all aspects of the campaign. The COMBI model was used to understand the barriers and facilitators to physical activity, and it was mapped across the resources to ensure that we took a comprehensive approach. So thinking about capability, opportunity and motivation within the work. We used the behavioural science evidence base to identify key behaviour change techniques and these were embedded in resources, messaging and training. Some of the findings are on screen for you, but suffice to say that the campaign exceeded our expectations in terms of engagement. And over 50% of the people who responded um, at the post-intervention point uh, met their physical activity goals. And we were so pleased with the outcomes that we're now redeveloping this campaign and it will be relaunched in May this year. So finally, just some things to consider. I'd ask you to think about what opportunities there are for applying behavioural science within your organisation. I'd encourage you to use the ABC guide to support your planning and programme development so that you can consider the behaviours, the influences on behaviour um, for the groups that you're actually targeting. This is a new area for many people uh, working in the public sector. And so we're developing guidance for employers to support managers uh, to think about the skills and competencies they might want to think about when they're employing behaviour change leads. And finally, think about working collaboratively with local experts and academics. Consider getting involved in broader networks such as the Behavioural Science and Public Health Network to support you to embed behavioural science in your programmes of work. Brilliant. That was fantastic. Um, thank you, Susan, Robert and Michelle. That's great. We have had a number of questions coming in and I'm sure um, more might follow as we talk. I'm going to start, if I may, um, I think one probably focused on the tools themselves. So probably direct these to Robert and Susan. Um, 
how about using the intervention ladder from the Nuffield uh, Council of Bioethics for the policy categories? Have you got anything to sort of say about the 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 um, alignment of those two different frameworks? Yes. Uh, so the Nuffield ladder focuses on a particular um, uh, dimension of interest, which is just the extent to which the uh, interventions are seen as somewhat coercive or uh, or reducing someone's agency. And the purpose of it is to help to guide people in terms of the acceptability. So that's the key here, is that um, the Nuffield ladder is focusing on one aspect of appease, uh, which is the acceptability to the key stakeholders and to society at large. Um, and, and it actually raises, I think, a really useful point about the whole um, raison d'etre of the, of the behaviour change wheel guide, is that there are lots of these models around, and the TARPAIR model as well, which focuses on um, certain other aspects. There are all these great frameworks and so on, but, but what they do is they focus on certain aspects, and, they, and if you look at them and compare them with the behaviour change wheel, of what you can see, or, or the models, you can see that they, they don't uh, folk, they don't uh, consider other aspects. What we tried to do in this guide, and uh, you know, it's not an easy task, um, but is to say, well, what if 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 you only had one model that would cover all of these things, including ex acceptability, effectiveness, and so on? What would that model look like? So that you've got a one-stop shop for this kind of intervention development. So that that's the main difference. Fantastic, I'm, Robert. I I'm think to take up another couple of the Please. questions that I've um, seen come in on behaviour change techniques. Um, so one question was about um, how do you choose which behaviour change techniques to use um, in designing an intervention? Um, if one's taken the uh, strategy we've been outlining, so you've identified one or more types of intervention that are likely to be effective, given what needs to change in terms of motivation and or capability and or opportunity, um, you'll then have identified probably quite a large number of behaviour change techniques because each intervention type has many different types of techniques uh, that could be used. If you think about persuasion as an intervention type, there are many techniques you can use to persuade. So then the question is, we can't use all of these behaviour change techniques in our intervention. We've got a long list here. How do we narrow it down? And I think that's where the appease criteria also come in helpful for thinking about which of these techniques is most relevant for your situation. You will be the expert in the uh, population you're targeting, the particular setting that you're involved in. And so you can run through these criteria. And that's a very good way of narrowing down um, the breadth of uh, behaviour change techniques that you include. There was another question about uh, behaviour change techniques, which was um, that most interventions have a large number of behaviour change techniques. And if one conducts an evaluation and has a result that it was effective to whatever extent it was effective, the question is then is, which of those behaviour change techniques are the ones that are doing the work? Because some may be doing a lot of work and being very effective, some may be doing nothing, and others might actually be counterproductive and you might be better off without them there. Um, there's also the issue about interactions between the behaviour change techniques. Um, there's a very interesting uh, methodology for trying to tease out these techniques uh, developed by Linda Collins in the States. Uh, that's referred to as MOST, standing for multi-phase optimization strategy. What that means is that you basically do a factorial experiment um, where you think about all the different combinations of behavior change techniques that there could be that were being effective, and then you just pull out uh, certain ones, and the design of your experiment means that you can actually identify uh, which, say, theoretically, combine clusters of these techniques of the ones that are, are being effective and which ones aren't. And we use this um, uh, successfully, the kind of idea of a factorial experiment, um, looking at a uh, alcohol reduction app called Drinkless uh, that uh, Claire Garnett and other colleagues um, developed at, at UCL. Uh, finally, I'll just say that um, in terms of the behavior change techniques, if you're interested, um, 
on, both on uh, iPhones and on Android, there's um, uh, an app with all the behavior change techniques and uh, their definitions and the groupings. And we will, in the coming months, also add to that by putting in the intervention type. So you can very easily, instead of looking up tables in the guide, uh, you can go from the uh, intervention type to the potential behavior change techniques that are likely to be effective. Because this guide is relatively brief, um, we haven't um, gone into all that detail, but there is the detail about the behavior change techniques in the longer guide. And one person um, said, oh, even this guide is too long. We wanted a two page version of it. Um, we do, Robert and I have produced some very brief two page uh, versions covering some of this material, uh, which you can find on a website called um, unlockingbehaviorchange.com. Brilliant. Thank you, Robinson. That's great. You've covered a number of questions there. Just on that last one, I'm just going to ask Michelle if she could maybe come in. One of the questions um, for people who are listening to this later um, who can't see the questions on the screen, the question was sort of feedback from a colleague in local government who said um, the colleague had said that as a manager in local government, they didn't believe that anyone had the time to or to read or engage with a, a guide like this. And they need a two page summary, just as Susan has said. So I wonder if, um, if Michelle, do you have any views? Are you working in local government yourself? What's your perspective on that? I think there is a perception that uh, if we are applying behaviour change that we, we're adding a whole load of work to things and making it more difficult. Um, and as I've said already, confidence can be quite low in doing that. I don't think that that's necessarily the case. And I also think that there is something really important in making sure that we are developing programs that are really effective. And if we're not thinking about how people are going to behave and interact with that, then actually we are missing a trick and we're running the risk of running programs that are not as effective as they might have been otherwise. Um, I would say have a look at the ABC guide. I'd be very happy to, to speak to colleagues working in local government about the approach that we've taken. And I think that the uh, behaviour change world is really flexible. Um, and even if you know people consider how people are interacting, think about combi, um, often that's a big step forward from where we've been in the past. The, one of the questions linked to that was that changing perspectives or engagement or the use of behaviour change, behavioural science in local government or other organisations is a behaviour change problem in itself. I know this is something we've we've discussed. What can we do, maybe Michelle as well, and then maybe Rob and Susan, you might have a perspective. What can we do to change perceptions about the role of behavioural science in our organisations that otherwise might ignore this sort of approach? I think we need to be um, sharing best practice. I think we need to be developing really good case studies um, that evidence how important this is and the difference that it makes um, and that actually a lot of this stuff is intuitive this there is a lot of really good work going on in local authorities already so it's about sharing that and building confidence around this agenda thank you robert susan did you want to add um, in my experience people use things when they find that they're useful because then that reinforces their use so i think the um main thing is to provide people with the opportunity um, capability uh, for doing this and then hopefully the motivation will come with that and I think if people um, feel that it is too long or too complicated then find somebody who's already using it uh, somebody who's been one, on one of our training courses etc uh, work alongside them I think Working in, in pairs or in small teams on things um, makes it much more rewarding and um, usually a much richer experience. Yeah, and I think one of the things that and Michelle can probably um, comment on this, but what we've observed in local authorities where they get behavioural scientists involved um, in work that's going on is those people become in, come into huge demand and they become rather like the IT services. Everyone wants, everyone wants a, a piece of it because they, once you re they recognise that they can add value to whatever it is they're doing, whether it's in waste management or whether it's in health, um, that uh, it becomes, you know, people start to see the value and, and eventually, um, well, quite quickly, they, they begin to think, well, how on earth did we manage without this? 
I think that's exactly right. And um, speaking on behalf of my own team, I know that we've been, um, in order to meet the demand, we've been running surgeries, so um, say four hours where people can just drop in and come and speak to us. And we weren't sure when we started whether this was going to be a bit of a tumbleweed experiment, but actually um, we're absolutely overflowing with people and the requests are coming in continuously. Um, so I think that's absolutely right. People are really, really interested. They want to learn, they want to, to use this. They see the value of it um, and it's really just sharing that message. Brilliant, thank you. I just We've got about five minutes left. I think one of the important questions to take, and we, I'm sorry we won't be able to take all of them. I know people are messaging and I think that's great that you're sharing some of your own experiences and, um, and resources. Um, I think one of the important questions to take is, when do people who um, you want to change the behavior of, or so the target population, when do, they, when do we get them involved in the process? Uh, yes, I think ideally we work with those people right from the beginning, um, that we should set up partnerships and networks and um, always be checking back with the people that we're, we're working so to speak, for, that we work with instead of for. And I think um, that's for several reasons. Uh, one is that the work we do is going to be so much better if we're really understanding the people and the contexts uh, that we're aiming to um, enable change with. Um, the other is that when we work in that way, um, we also will make the whole community identify, engage more, and it will be, we are thinking about and addressing problems together and coming up with solutions. And that will just be so much more enabling um, for everyone uh, than having parallel streams and then just occasionally, you know, dipping in and dipping out. Now, having said that, that's a difficult thing to achieve in practice, but I think that's what we should be aiming for. Fantastic. Do you um, just maybe one of the maybe the last question? There's been a number of questions about some other great resources, um, things like the Basic Framework, um, Cards for Change, developed by Manchester University, um, and a few other things. I know this is. I think I said at the beginning. You know, this is this is one guide, uh, and potentially it could become the first of a, of a set of guidance um, for local government and other partners and organisations. Does anyone have any perspective in terms of keeping it simple, maybe, for people in terms of the, the message um, versus kind of having a plethora of pieces of guidance that, and a menu of, of guidance that we maybe make available? Um, yes, I'd like to um, mention the Cards for Change developed by Joe Hart and Lucy burn in Manchester University that are based on the behavior change techniques and they've adapted them for uh, training and they're a small deck of cards very visually attractive um, with what the technique is and then how to deliver it in practice and they're using these cards um, to help train um, people all over the world especially in uh, lower and middle income countries so I think the more that we can have these tangible tools um, to, to support the work that we're all doing, the better, because otherwise um, things can seem very abstract if people aren't familiar with the evidence and the theory and the way of thinking. But somehow just having you know, either a smartphone app, packs of cards, make the whole thing um, come to life and make it much more um, tractable and tangible uh, for people. So, um, you know, Quite a few of us are trying to get resources to uh, develop this further. Um, and I think developing resources um, for people that, and again, developing them alongside people who want to use those resources will make them as effective as possible. But I think really that's something we should be looking to over the next few years um, to, to make our evidence, our theories, uh, the potential we have in behavioral science much more useful and usable by absolutely everybody uh, across society. Thank you, Susan. Robert and Susan, do you have any sort of final brief remarks to make? Anything you've kind of noted from the questions that have been messaged across? 
yes, I think one of the um, things that's come up in the questions, and we've sort of alluded to, but I think it's worth emphasizing in the um, is around the fact that there's multiple frameworks, and that is always going to be the case. There's always going to be uh, lots of uh, frameworks, and when you're looking at which one to use, whether it's East or Mindspace or Tarpar or uh, any of the others, the key thing to try and bear in mind is how, how to what extent does it cover all of the bases that you need covered? Um, or, or can it be used in conjunction with another one? I mean, there is a risk, I think, that if one has too much uh, stuff out there, then one goes for one which looks easiest, even though it might not uh, necessarily deliver. And what we've tried to do in this guide is to pull together the frameworks that, so it should be possible. And, that's, and looking at the, you know, certainly from the ones that we've worked with, we see that, oh, you know, that framework fits nicely within because it was draw you know it was used to build the um the, the behavior change wheel uh, process but you know there are lots of different perspectives and ultimately it's got to be something that's usable um and it's always a tension between how comprehensive you can be and how useful it is um but um uh, you know don't be put off looking at other guides but uh, obviously we think that this one's probably the most comprehensive and could i just add that um all of all of my work is work in progress and this guide um and also <laughs> work previously has been the result of huge interactions with thousands of people over training courses, over research collaborations, etc. And it's really important that we see this as an ongoing process, a collaborative process. I think in the guide, there's um, a, an email address to uh, for any feedback. If there isn't, uh, please do feel free to give me any feedback about the guide um, because We'll always be bringing out new things. So your feedback about what works, what doesn't, what's missing, what you'd like added, et cetera, uh, will be invaluable uh, for future work. So keep in touch. And it's been great to um, talk with you, albeit rather remotely uh, today. Thanks very much. Um, last couple of minutes. So Michelle, last comments from you, brief words. I think that the work that we're doing in local authorities and in the public sector relies so heavily on behavioral science and behavior change, you know, that we really, really need to think about this and take it seriously. And we need pragmatic approaches to embedding this in, into the work that we do. So I think guides like this are really, really important. Have a look at it have a go with it, don't be afraid um, to try and actually do think about working with your local academic colleagues, behavioral scientists working in your area and get involved and talk to other people to share best practice. There's so much good work going on out there. If we can share that and learn from each other, then that would be an amazing way forward. Brilliant, thank you. So just a brief comment. Um, there was a question about targeting public health commissioners um, so that new services are developed using um, using these tools as part of the planning. Again, I'm just going to, I did mention the introduction, but the EQUIP project led by University of Coventry and, and University of um, Hertfordshire, Catherine Brown, um, is doing exactly that uh, with a small commission to support that working with local government um, from Public Health England. There's a few suggestions that I've noted down, I think, from the, the feedback around engaging um, local, local authority comms with this, maybe producing basic guides for elected members. And um, there was a couple of questions around linking to evaluation that we have thought about. We know it's not the kind of focus of this guidance, but I think there is a lot of overlap and um, links between behavioral science, behavior change, and evaluation that we could think about for subsequent guides. So I just want to wrap up by saying thank you very much, everyone, for dialing in. Huge thanks to, to Rob and Susan for leading the authoring of the report and, and sharing this with us today. Thanks to Michelle for advising on the report and sharing her perspective from local government. Thanks to Lucy Porter and our, in my team here at Public Health England for arranging the webinar and sorting that all out. And um, the recording will be available shortly online. We'll email that to everyone who attended or expressed an interest in this, and we'll tweet, tweet the link to. Um, we're tweeting around hashtag ABC guide, uh, and the, like I said, there's, you can see the, the, the link to the guide on the website there, so please do share it. Thanks very much for attending. I hope you found it very useful. Bye for now. <laughs>